Shopify Masters is powered by Shopify, the easiest way to sell online, in person, and anywhere in between. To get an extended 30-day trial, visit shopify.com slash masters. Maybe that means you experiment with some new line of products and you say, I'm going to make the product more expensive, so that will offset the cost of that third free product. Hey, my name is Felix. I'm the host of Shopify Masters. Each and every week, you'll learn the keys to success from e-commerce experts and entrepreneurs just like you. In this episode, you'll learn how to package your products to increase your average order value, the simple framework for creating high converting product descriptions, and the highest converting type of email content. Today, I'm joined by Dustin Lee from Retro Supply. Retro Supply sells digital assets for graphic designers and illustrators inspired by history and was started in 2013 and based out of Portland, Oregon. Welcome, Dustin. Hey, Felix. Thanks for having me. Yeah, excited to have you on. So yeah, tell us a bit more about these uh, assets. What exactly do you, are you selling uh, to, to designers and illustrators? Yeah, so graphic designers typically need additional tools than the ones that come with the products they work with. So if you work in Photoshop or Illustrator, for instance, there's a variety of add-ons you can you can get. So for instance, custom brushes that get you a very specific effect or little things called actions, which are basically little programs that will run and achieve a certain effect. So I sell a variety of those as well as fonts. Got it. So this is a pretty established uh, industry in a sense that there are people out there that are looking for products like this and people that are out there that are providing it. When you first came onto the scene in 2013, you know, about, I guess, five years ago, was it, what was the competition like at the time? The competition was, I would say there was competition, but it was different. So when I first started thinking about making a business like this, I was looking at sites called, there's one called Envato, Envato Network, and they have something mm-hmm. called Graphic River. And they were selling a lot of these, but people were were sort of just packaging them very sparsely, I guess. There wasn't a lot to them. You might get a few brushes and maybe some brief text file instructions. And then a company called Creative Market opened up and they were, uh, I don't want to use the, I don't want to use the word higher quality, but it just had a more community feel to it. Mm -hmm. And I was buying stuff on that platform when it occurred to me that I thought, hey, maybe I have a unique take on this that I think might do well. Got it. And what was that unique take at the time? Is it that they were inspired, these were assets that were inspired by history? Was that your your angle? Um, No. So, well, I'm from from Portlandia. So vintage retro stuff is very popular and common here. So I was inspired by that. But I was working for a, a business that specialized in internet marketing and I was kind of a copywriting nerd as well as a graphic designer, mm-hmm. a marketing nerd in general. And what I noticed was designers didn't really package up what they were doing in the same way that internet marketers would package things with mm-hmm. you know, clean sales pages and calls to actions and opt-ins. And I thought, I think that that could be really effective in selling more products. So I started using all of those techniques essentially to sell products. And I think it was one of the first times that someone had aggressively done that in that space. And that paid off early for me. Got it. Makes sense. So you were not doing this full time, of course, at at the beginning. Talk talk to us a little bit about your, uh, what, what you were doing essentially prior to, or at the same time as launching Retro Supply. Right. So I was working for a company called pay to exist, which was helping first time solopreneurs build businesses. I was a graphic designer, contracted graphic designer for that business. And I learned so much about, you know, sales funnels and then just the entire process of how people become customers. And then I quit that because me and the founder became friends and we made this startup called a playbook that it just never really got traction. We, we were in over our heads. And as a result, I had like no money coming in. I was $35,000 in credit card debt. I then found out I had a baby on the way that we weren't expecting. (laughs) And (laughs) I I didn't know what to do because I had committed 40 hours a week to the startup that was not really making any money. And I needed something at the very least to save face and say I was trying to do something else that was making money. Mm -hmm. So I started getting up early and working on just this little side business. And it was really just a Every day, you know, an hour, hour and a half working on 
what became my business now, which is Retro Supply. Yeah, that, that's a, I think it's a great story because I think this is a, a place that a lot of entrepreneurs are at or went through as well, where they had something that that was more stable going on, but they knew that they could and wanted to 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 get more out of life, to, to earn more money, to be able to support themselves a bit better. And they find ways to carve in these times, these opportunities to work on this other business. And in your case, eventually became the, 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 the thing that actually consumed your life. Now, for people out there that are still in this phase where they are balancing between the two, any, any recommendations here? Like, how do you recommend people if they are can you have a nine to five or some regular day job? How can they get better at finding and carving at that time to work on, on that side business that they're on? Yeah, I can give you actually a really pretty relevant recent example. So despite the fact that I'm a graphic designer, I'm not a great illustrator. I, I used to be good at drawing and I, and I just, I lost it at some point and I wanted to get better recently. And so I started something that was a hundred day project essentially where every day I did a drawing and posted on Instagram and when I started, my drawings were embarrassingly bad. And I did it every night for about an hour. And I'm on day 98 now. Nice. And you can see a dramatic difference. I mean, I spent probably anywhere from 20 minutes to on a really insane night. Like I'd go crazy and spend an hour and a half, two hours on this drawing. But it was just little chunks every day. And when I started the business, that's really what it was. I, I kind of, I didn't say to myself, I'm going to make this much money this month. I said, I'm going to follow a system. I'm going to say every morning I'm going to get up and I'm going to work on this business day in and day out and see where that gets me. And I, I found that every time I've gotten traction in something, it's been because I followed a system mm -hmm. as opposed to choosing a goal and then being disappointed if I didn't hit that goal when I thought I would. Yeah, I think that's a good point. I, I've heard this as well, where there's people that that, that tell you to stay away from having this goal in your head because the goal is very vague. Like, how do you get there, right? And the system is what, you, the system, the process that you put in place is what you can show up every day and just do it without having to think about this looming goal and just put in the work and eventually over time you look back and say, wow, I made all this progress that I didn't even recognize at first. So when you create the system, in your example, whether, I think, let's just talk about the example of you starting this business. When mm -hmm. you create the system, how did you know what it should look like and how did you reinforce it so that you actually showed up every day and did the, did the, the work? I think it was made, it was, honestly, it was really made out of desperation. So I had this child coming and that really created a, a, a countdown timer in my head. And I don't think you have to have something like some sort of crazy crisis to, to make, to make you do that. But I think having a clear reason why, or just really those first couple of days I've noticed are the hardest to start just starting. And again, accepting that it's a system or a process and doing it every day, but certainly having some sort of reason if that, whether that's your family. Um, I, I coach some people on building businesses like this. And when I talk to them, a lot of times, for instance, they'll say, well, I just want to provide something different for my family, or maybe I want to carve out more time or more freedom in my schedule for my family. So sometimes it's family, sometimes it's a, it's a girlfriend or boyfriend or loved one. Sometimes it's that they want to be able to, you know, travel more or something. I think having that thing in mind and wanting it very badly can be really high leverage. So I think that's what motivated me to do it. And then I think the other thing is most people are very, know a lot about the product that they want to sell, but they don't know a lot about acquiring customers and verifying that people want what they're selling. And I think everyone would have a much easier time if they invested the time to learn how to do that. Mm -hmm. Now, how do you identify, or at that time, how did you identify how you should be using your time? Like you're saying that you were focusing on a particular, you, you noticed that the, the people weren't packaging digital assets the, the same way that the other online marketers were, were doing it. But then how did you actually take that knowledge? So, okay, today I'm going to do X, Y, and Z. Oh, right. Great question. Yeah. So what I did is I went on to creative market. So before I had my Shopify shop, I was on a platform called creative market that lets you sell your mm -hmm. items there and get set up very quickly. So I, I basically went on there and what I did is I looked at what products were doing well already. And I looked for overlaps between what was doing well, what I thought I could do as good or better or differently. 
And then I started experimenting with making my own versions of those products. So I would say, how can I add value in a way that this person can't, that makes me stand out? Or how can I do this differently? A lot of times I would look through the comments on the products and the reviews, and I would look for what's wrong with this product that people are mentioning, or I would buy the product and say, what is missing when I use it that I find frustrating? And then I would just choose one. And typically it would take me uh, on average about five days to make a product. So I would make that product, release it, and then just see what happened. And then I would continue the cycle. And then I would just look for feedback and see what, what is selling, what isn't selling. And obviously I would do more of what was making money and less of what wasn't. And that slowly got me more and more money. I think my first month I made seven, maybe five to $700. And I kept trying different things. And when things really became successful was when I finally completely abandoned the template that the people before me were using in terms of how they laid out the products. And I just said, I, I know people need this particular product and I'm going to make it the way I wish it was made. And I really started to say to myself, I'm going to make all the things that I wish people had made in this space that no one will make. And when I did that, it was like a floodgate release, like literally within a couple of weeks, uh, I had made more money than I had made it any job in a couple of weeks. It was insane. Got, got it. So you were taking this this approach, which I think can work in other industries as well, where you were doing this research by identifying products that are selling well, but can be improved upon by either you using yourself and you determining what kind of features or what, what changes you would make, or just looking at the reviews and seeing what people were complaining about or where people were saying, I wish this product did X. So you knew what you should be improving. You went and created, created a better product. And then you put it out on, onto the marketplace, but how did you make sure that customers were understanding that this was the particular change or improvement that you made so that they should try your product out rather than the, the competing product? So there was a few things that I did. One was because it was, I was selling to graphic designers, graphic designers by their nature are very visual people. So I made preview images and I remember thinking to myself when I did it, I'm going to make preview images, product shots that are good enough that they could be printed onto a box in a store. Because everyone before that was, I think, despite the fact that they were graphic designers, they weren't spending that time on making the, the product shots as strong as they could be. And mm -hmm. I said, I'm going to make this look so good that you want to pick it up. I think that made a really big impact. Another thing I did was I did before and afters in the images a lot. So I could say, here's what happens before when you purchase this. Here's what will happen after you use it. And it just made a very clear contrast about what was going to happen. The other thing I did was I'm a, I'm a big believer in trying to eliminate any uncertainty about people for people about what they're buying. So I would make the name. So when they read the name, they can have a pretty good guess what the product does. When they see the cover of the product, that first picture they see, they have a, they can take a very good educated guess on what that product does. And when they read the copy, there's, very clear bullets, short paragraphs, and I immediately get to the point in the very first sentence of what the product does. So it's really just about like in as many different ways as I can explaining, like you said, that that result before they lose mm -hmm. interest. Right, that makes sense. So while you were on Creative Market, this is basically like a platform similar to someone like selling on Amazon, if they're selling a physical product or something like that. So you weren't, you didn't actually own the website that you were selling on initially. So you mentioned in the pre-interview about how you were able to start instituting things like sales funnels and list building into your, your essentially your marketing engine. Was that possible on a website like Creative Market or, or was it only possible once you moved off of it? It was only possible once I moved off of it. One of the things that I had really learned the power of when I was working for the consulting business that I worked for was that your email list is so important because it's the one thing that you have control over in reaching your customers. So for instance, on Creative Market, Creative Market is fantastic. I love Creative Market. I know all the people that work there and, and they do a fantastic job. But just at the end of the day on someone else's platform, you don't control if they send an email about you. You don't get to get all the information you want. And that's fine and fair because that's their platform. So I'm happy to be on it, but I also realized if I really want to have more control over my own financial well-being, I need to move people over to my platform as much as I can. 
And that's where Shopify came in along with MailChimp. So by, so the real trick to it was most people on creative market would have a little bio area and they would say, my name is Pete and I like to drink coffee and design stuff. And I used mine and just use a very simple call to action. I said, do you like, do you like these products or do they look cool? Visit www.retrosupply.co and get nine free products. And that drove a lot of traffic in the beginning to my own site where people would opt in for my email list. And then I could start to market to them regularly about new products. Okay, so this wasn't like a hard cut over. You're able to drive the traffic from the platform, the marketplace to your own website because you're able to make this kind of announcement on your bio that, hey, there's, there's, there is a good reason why you should leave, not leave, but you should check out this other website, which is your, your own website. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. I wasn't trying, I wasn't trying to, um, I was trying to respect the platform I was on because I mean, they, they literally gave me my financial freedom, but I was also trying to say, Hey, you know, if you want to be more immersed in the brand that I'm making, you can go to my own site and sign up and you'll get even more cool stuff. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think that certainly you do within a balance of, of the platform that you're on, but I think that it's great that you weren't just saying, Hey, go here and it's exact same experience you would get on the, the, the marketplace. You were actually giving them a, a value add by saying, you go to this website, there's more that you can get. So I think that's important. Otherwise people would just, there's no reason for them to leave the, the platform essentially. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So now during this, this transition period where you're driving uh, traffic to, to your, to retro supply, what, 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 what was the incentive for get to getting people to sign up for the, the mailing list? So the incentive was I was giving them nine free products essentially. So I made nine unique products that you couldn't purchase. You only could get them if you signed up for the email list. And it was really important that I, that I did that because I think sometimes people get email opt-ins wrong in the sense that they offer something that a lot of people want. So for instance, contests are one way that people will grow email lists and they'll say, you know, sign up for my email list and get the chance to win an iPad or something like that. And as I'm sure you know, that that, that will get you a lot of subscribers. The problem is that mm -hmm. everybody wants an iPad. So yeah. I was like very specific and intentional in saying, I'm going to only offer things that are similar to what I'm going to sell. Once I had... Not, not even very many people on that list. Uh, I was just sending out product updates there. And over the course of about two years, it became a, maybe a 50-50 split between how much I made on one on Creative Market and on my own platform. And, and today it's like a 90-10 a split. Very cool. So you, you built this email list and you mentioned also in the pre-interview about how you not only use email lists to sell stuff, but also to educate and get feedback from from your customers. Now, when you sit down and decide to create a, a, a campaign or some kind of funnel, some kind of a email autoresponder funnel, how do you balance between what you should, what kind of content you should be putting into your emails? Yeah, good question. I That was a learning process for me because the, the business I worked for before was really in the business of doing a lot of educating and they sold one core product essentially that was like either 500 or a thousand dollars. And for me, I'm selling things that are anywhere from 19 to $500, but my average transaction is like $35. So at first I was just sending out announcements about new products, but I would try to make the copy compelling and interesting and surprising and i would include a lot of media so i would have a video of the product i would have interesting copy i would have lots of preview images i might have a sample of the product and i realized that i need to provide people with a wider spectrum of content it can't all just be sales stuff even if you make it as entertaining as you can and that's when I started to work on making a mix of tutorials. So we would do tutorials on how to create a certain effect or achieve a certain result. As a graphic designer, we would have blog posts that were interviews with influencers in the industry. We would have free webinars where we would give information away with uh, thought leaders again in the industry. And when I started to mix all those, that did really well. And what did really, really well is if when I can mix together Great content that is good on its own, but even better if you buy the product. That's really like the sweet spot when you can hone in on that. Can you say a little more about that? Like, what is how do you how did you, what's an example of, of something like that? 
Yeah. Okay. So for example, um, there's an engraving effect I sell. It's called the grave grave etcher and it creates this just old school vintage engraving look. And so we had a tutorial where we taught about how to make an engrave an engraving illustration of an eye. And you could look at the tutorial and it looked great. I mean, you'd see this final end image and it's, it's a great stunning image, something that you'd want to know how to do. And if you follow the tutorial, you can do it for sure. But if you bought this brush pack we were selling, you could do it in mm. one fifth, one tenth the time with a, a few strokes of your mouse. So that would, that did really well because the people that don't want to buy would still enjoy it, but then you still in the back of your head, like, Oh man, I could do this so easy if I just buy this product. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I've seen this before where it's like, it's the approach of here's how you can do it for free. Here, we're giving you free content. Here's how you can do it. But Hey, if you want the result even faster, you can just buy the result by using this product. Ab- absolutely. And, it, I, and I've even had people like write and say those exact words. You'll see this scripted kind of gold, boiled lettering effect. And we were selling, we still sell a pack that would get you that effect on your lettering and people would put it onto merchandise and things like that, like pillows and stuff. And I made a tutorial and I decided I'm just going to give away the complete secret to doing it without any of my products. And I made a tutorial on that. I showed them how to do it. And despite giving them every detail on how to do it, there's always like a certain amount of customers that just say, you know what? I watched you do it. It took 15 minutes. I'd rather just buy this thing and have it done in like 20 seconds. And people would write me and say, I just bought this because I just watched it and said, no, nah, too much trouble. I don't care if I have to spend 20 or $30 to get the result. Right. Makes sense. Now, how do you decide or recognize what people want to be educated about? Like, how do you know, how do you create that, that calendar essentially you have educational content? Mm, yeah. Good question. Um, I use a, I use a couple things. So, so early on, I did a lot of just looking at the stuff that I enjoyed or the stuff that I found myself searching for. Cause uh, people go both ways on this, but I really was my own customer in a lot of ways. So I knew what I wanted. And I suspected I knew what other people wanted too. Uh, another thing that I would do is I would go on to sites like that were specific to my industry for social media. So for instance, dribble is a, a social media platform for designers and they'll share their latest work. You know, what are you working on? And people will post an image of something And a lot of times when you look in the comments of that section, people will say, how did you do that? Or how did you get that effect or that, that result right there on your, on your work? And people on dribble tend to not answer those Mm -hmm. comments. Uh, And I think it's mostly because they feel like I'm sharing my work here. I'm not, it's not that they're trying to be withholding about it. It's just that they're sharing their work and they're not there to spend a lot of time explaining things, Mm -hmm. you know, because they're busy. And so I would just look at those responses and say, okay, no one's answering this. Clearly a lot of people want to know, and I'll use that to come up with good questions that I can answer. So that was one way. Another way that I've used is sites like, but, um, I believe it's called buzz sumo. Mm -hmm. So you can look on there and let's say I'm selling a, a pack of, brushes that are like, give you the effect of an old 1950s advertising, um, drawing. I would go on to, to buzz sumo and I would look up retro Photoshop brushes or something like that. And it would show up all sorts of content and how many, how many shares it got, how many on different platforms. And then I would just go look at those pieces of content and say, you know, why did some content do better than other content? Um, Mm-hmm. So I, I did a lot of that. And then just like a simple Google search, you know, see, is there people looking for this on Google? And if so, what are the top results and how can I make an article that's a little different or better or more in depth or more niche? Yeah. I, I think if you are not, uh, your, your customer in your case, you are the customer, the, uh, you, you are the customer essentially, but if you don't have that kind of understanding of what kind of questions you might have, I think that's a great approach by going out and seeing what questions people are asking and not getting the answer to that's the opportunity for you to come in and be such like a, a, a thought leader in that, in that space by providing the, the content for free. And then of course they'll discover your, your, your store that way as well. 
Um, so I think your success you mentioned was, especially when you are, were on a marketplace or a platform like Creative Market, a lot of it became around your copy. And I looked at on your, your current website on a product description is very in depth. There's a lot, there's a lot going on in there. What's your approach to, to creating copies, particularly around product descriptions? I generally follow a, a formula over and over again. Uh, and it's just, it's a very co common copywriting formula, which is AIDA. It's an acronym that stands for attention, interest, desire, action. So I'll put the attention typically is a headline and that's getting their attention by telling them something like uh, the, the most intense or emotionally um, stimulating way to talk about the result of the product. And then interest is where you start to describe the problem and what it's like to have a solution to it. And then the desire is where you talk about your specific solution in, in like details, that's typically bullet points. So people can easily scan through and say, does this meet the criteria of what I need? And then the action part is where you literally ask people to buy. And it, it's so funny. You wouldn't think on a, on an e-commerce site, you would need to ask people to buy, but <laughs> you do. I mean, if, if you've ever shopped on Amazon, which who hasn't, right? Sometimes I'm on there and I forget that I'm there to buy stuff. Mm -hmm. Like I, I'm just looking, I'm like, oh, this is cool. This is cool. Anyways, what was I doing? And I leave. So I think that seeing, you know, buy now things or buy this product now, or if you want to get this result faster today, buy this product. It sounds a little shamwow sometimes. It can feel a little cheesy when you do it, but you have to remind people, um, people are so distracted. It, I think it really helps to be clear and respect the fact that people's attention is pulled a lot of directions when they're at home in front of a computer at work. Yeah, I think it's important to know that people's state of minds are not the same, or all your customers, all your visitors, their state of mind is not the same when they come to your website. One person might be coming in and, you know, you go to a mall and you're the type of person who knows exactly what you want. You walk, walk right into the store that you want, walk right down the aisle, pick it up and go buy it. There's that type of customer, but then there's also the kind of passive person who's walking through and then they're spending money, but they're not really looking for anything specific, right? You want to capture yes. those people's attentions too and say, hey... You, this is something that you, you want in your life, you need in your life, that's going to improve your life, and then actually ask them to buy because they're almost like a zombie like shopper, right? And that's the type of customer that you also want to, to capture at the same time. Yeah, I've never heard that term, but that's such a good term because I'm totally that zo that zombie shopper sometimes. Like, you know, I'm walking around Target and I'm like, how did I get here? Wait, why am I here? <laughs> so that absolutely yeah. happens. And, and also, it's true. Sometimes people take like two years to buy a product. I mean, I've had people mm -hmm. on my email list and then two years later, they become a really great customer and they've been getting these emails for years. So you just never know. Um, and just the last thing about copy, I feel like I should say is I'm not, you know, I'm not a copywriting genius. I'm inconsistent. Uh, I try things that don't work. Sometimes I have spelling errors. I mean, I am not perfect. I think the thing that has really helped me is just that I just have consistently done it. And I, I, I try to leverage everything I have, but for anyone like that's like, oh my gosh, I don't want to learn copywriting. That's intimidating. Uh, I'm not a copywriting genius. I just, I've read some books because I find it interesting. And then I just apply that as best I can. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think the framework that you talked about, the ADA, AIDA, attention, interest, desire, action, I think it's a great framework for someone to get started because you literally just plug it in and you don't have to think about the entire, going back to the theme that we we're talking about earlier about thinking about the entire goal of having the perfect product description, just come in, use the system that, that, that exists, put in the work and then you get at least better than where you were at before. So I think that that's important that you don't try to become perfect, but just work the system. And over time, uh, the first time you probably get something better than what you had. And then over time, it would become even better and better. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. Got it. Yeah. So now I want to talk about some of the um, the applications that you're using on your your website. I noticed a couple of things on there that you're using. Uh, it looks a combination of Heap and and Hotjar. Is that something that you use for for analytics on your website? Yeah. So I, I signed up for Hotjar. Gosh, it must've been a couple of years ago now. I, I was literally like one of the beta users. And I think what I was really attracted to about it at first was, well, first of all, there was something, I'm probably going to butcher this name, but there's another surveying piece of software called, I think, Qualaroo or Qualaroo? Are you mm -hmm. familiar with that? Yeah. Yeah. I know what you're talking about. It's like it pops up in the lower right-hand corner, ask a question or something. 
Right. Yeah, exactly. So it was like, I think at the time, a couple of years ago, I don't know what it is now, but it was like something like a hundred dollars, $150, whatever it was, it was out of my price range. And it, and it just did that, but it did it really well. And they were just, Hotjar was just starting and they were offering that plus heat maps. Plus, um, you could actually record users on the screen, which is a bit invasive. It's kind of, you know, you got to decide like how, if you feel comfortable doing that Mm -hmm. or not, but it had so many different things. And so I started using that to ask questions. For instance, I would use the survey and a little poll would pop up on a page for a new product and say, as they're about to leave the page and abandon it, um, if you're not buying this right now, can you, you know, can you tell me why? And a lot of times that would help me find weak spots in the product. You know, I don't know if this works with my version of Photoshop or Illustrator or the price is too high or, or, or just whatever. So that was very useful. Um, and also recording people was really useful. I don't do it a lot, but when something new is put onto the website, a new feature or maybe a new product, it's interesting to to see how people travel across your site and what they do, because you'll often see bottlenecks that despite the best Google and analytics data is very hard to see without actually watching someone. Yeah, I think it's um, particularly if you are more of a visual learner, I think heat maps are way better than the the like Google Analytics because Google Analytics, you get the data, but you still have to process it, and understand how it all fits together and especially how users flow from one place to the other. I think heat maps and recordings are, are almost more instant in terms of recognizing what's the issue. It's like more glaring almost. It's a little more personal too. You know, like when you see analytics, you don't really get a sense for why someone left. But if you're watching a, a heat map or a video of someone, you can see that you can see the pause on a certain area. Or you can see them flip back and forth over and over again to this same image. And you can say, why do they keep flipping back to that image right before they abandon? And you might not ever know that with analytics. Right. That makes sense. Uh, have there been any recent or or, or um, yeah, recent change that you've had to make based on the survey or heat map or recordings that they made you recognize, oh, this is something that we have to change on our site? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So in the past, something that I noticed was First of all, my call to action on my homepage, if you go to it, there's a hero image and it it gets people to sign up for the email list, but it's really big. Like it would take up the whole screen almost. And just by looking at what people were doing, looking at heat maps, looking at some videos, you could see that people couldn't see that there was multiple categories of products just below that. So by just shrinking the height, of that image. So people could get like a hint that there was products below that, that immediately boosted sales. Mm, So it's, it's funny. There's so many things you would just never even think of looking at. And it's so helpful to see those things. Got it. So can can you give us an idea of how successful the business has, has grown to today? You've been in business, I think, like we were saying earlier, five years now, starting 2013. Uh, Has this become, or over time, how did it replace your other sources of income? Right. Oh, yeah, it was it was dramatic. So um, when I first really honed in on the kind of products that worked for me, I I remember I had this day, which I called like the like slot machine day with my phone, because, mm-hmm. you know, you get your notifications on your phone. And I remember when I was featured in an email on Creative Market for a new product and it went out to a list of, I don't know, maybe 100,000 people. And my phone just and, and remember, I'm broke and have a baby on the way. I'm, I'm in debt. and And the phone just started giving me notifications so fast. They were starting to like blip over the top of each other. And each one was a sale of uh, like 10 to $20. And I remember I literally packed my stuff up in the Starbucks where I was working and I ran home. It was like a walking distance place. And I ran home to my wife who was pregnant so she could hear the phone blipping. And I was like, do you hear that? I was like, every one of those is a sale. And by the end of the day, it was $1,700. And I mean that's a lot of money. I mean, especially for anybody, that's a lot of money, but especially when you're in debt and you're wondering how am I going to pay for diapers and baby food? I know that sounds dramatic, but literally I was thinking that kind of stuff. Um, so anyways, that, that really taught, that taught me two lessons that taught me number one, email lists are good and important. And it taught me, and it kind of reinforced that my business, um, that I, I was onto something, but anyway, so that first year, I think it made $80,000 that was including my freelance work and that business. The second year I just had retro supply and it made, I believe like 180,000. The second year it made like 230,000. And then the most recent year it made 
400,000. Amazing. So when you were growing this business, like were there certain inflection points where you jump from, you know, 80,000, 180,000 to eventually 400,000? Were there changes or was it more of like a, just a time in the game type of situation? Well, it was definitely like getting established in time in the game, like you said, but there was also big aha moments that happened along the way that made dramatic results. Uh, the one that immediately comes to mind is I I never really thought about average order value. People, I, I think the acronym for that is AOV, average order value. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I never really thought about that. And then I started like analyzing what my average order value was. And it was, uh, I think like $21 or something and, and something cents. And I started thinking, whoa, it's hard. It's it's very hard to get new customers, but it's not so hard to it's not nearly as hard to increase the average order average order value or average cart value or whatever. And so I started thinking, how can I make people spend more when they have a transaction? And I just did something really simple. I I put a and it's still there to this day. I put a little drop down bar on the top of the site, and it would say, "Buy two products, get one free." Mm. And immediately, I mean, overnight, like it went from, you know, the average order value being $22 to the average order value being, I think, $29. And through tweaking, I think now it's up to, you know, on most months around $35, $36, $37. So, I mean, as you can imagine, you know, when you have thousands of transactions happening a year, uh, a $10 or $15 change makes a dramatic difference in how much money you make. Yeah, and I think that especially works for people that are selling digital products because you are not incurring the the inventory cost. For anyone out there that cannot offer a 100% free product, I think even things like offering free shipping or a discount code if they reach a certain average order value are good incentives, you know, good enough incentives to get people to try to break past that threshold and get that, you know, whatever reward it is that you're offering. Absolutely, and, and also, and maybe you can probably speak to this better, Felix, but just restructure I mean, you can kind of think of it as glasses and each glass is a product and how much liquid is in the glass is the money. So let's say you want to give a product away for free. Maybe that means you experiment with some new line of products and you say, I'm going to make the product more expensive. Mm. So that will offset the cost of that third free product, for instance. Um, So if you were selling coffee that you were shipping, for instance, maybe the coffee is more expensive, but that makes it so you can give away a third bag or a little bonus because it's covered by the cost of buying too. So I think restructuring offers can can dramatically change how people perceive and how much they buy. Yeah. Oh no, I think that's a great point. Like pricing is very psychological. You you there's there's you know tiering and anchoring between prices to where if you see something that's really expensive to get next to something that's cheaper, you you start breaking identifying the different value in it. But yeah, certainly you could package mm-hmm. things in different ways that make it uh, essentially appear more valuable. So I think that that's a great point that you can find ways to to make it work within your your budget or within your margins. So you, you're in a situation where you, you're, in a, you're creative, but then you also really understand marketing. I think that combination where you can not only create the product, but then also uh, sell it, I think it's such a great one-two punch for anyone out there that wants to start a business. I think where we see a lot of people, they start on one end or the other. And because you've been, you're in a situation where you are creative, you understand that side more and transition to selling products. Can you speak more about this? Like how can someone that's in the situation where they have creative talents, they have art, they want to sell the stuff that they're creating, but they don't know how to begin. What are the steps towards creating a business around, uh, you know, around a freelancing business that you already have where you're selling your service. Now you want to be able to branch out and, and become, uh, sell more products and create more of a passive income stream that you've done. Right. Yeah. That's a, that's a really good question. I, I think part of it is knowing what you really want. So do you want to make a lot more money or do you want to have the fulfillment of being creative? So a lot of times I'll see even designers, you know, no one, no one says, Oh, someday I want to lay out brochures for a living. You know, most designers are artists that realize that they can make money, better money as a graphic designer than a fine artist, for instance. But if you want to sell something, you really have to start thinking about customers and you can't think about just your own artistic integrity and I think that's hard for some people. So I guess you just have to decide, is it's my priority to make money or is my priority to, you know, to, to express myself through my art? And there's not a right answer. You just have to know what that answer is for you. The second thing is 
and I think people will be able to apply this to all sorts of different endeavors. Um, the big shift for me was this in graphic design, for instance, there's so many people that are freelance designers or big agencies. And when there's that many, you know, you know, it's a classic 80, 20 principle, like 20% of these people are going to be in more demand than the other 80% combined. Right. So I think what I started to realize is I realized, let's be realistic here. By definition, 80% is going to be the minority in terms of how much work they get. And I shifted from the idea of I'm going to sell to, I'm going to try to sell my services to businesses, for instance, to I'm going to sell to other designers because designers like to work on, you know, cool projects for clients. They don't so much like to scan in textures and make, you know, Photoshop brushes or illustrator brushes. And I, I decided I'm going to be the guy that does that thing that no one wants to do. And then I'm going to package it up in a really fun and exciting way for them. So why would they ever do it themselves when I'm doing it for them? And um, it kind of reminds me of that whole story of during the gold rush, they say the people that made the most money were the people selling the picks and axes or the pans and <laughs> pans yeah. and picks or whatever, not the people that were actually mining for gold. And sometimes I feel like that's so true. You know, there's so many designers trying to do that, but there's not very many designers trying to provide assets. Um, I could tell you one more story real quick about this of someone who's been hugely successful mm -hmm. with this. Um, there's a, a fantastic designer named Aaron Draplin. And he made, uh, he does design work and it's amazing, but he created a company called Field Notes and mm -hmm. it creates um, just little notebooks for people. And it says, and their tagline is, I'm not trying, I'm not writing it down to remember it later. I'm writing it down to remember it now or something like that. But anyways, these are very simple notebooks and I suspect he's made an absolute killing. They're all, they're in so many stores, but it's not him showing off his design talents, although they're well-designed. It's him making a product that makes designers and other people heroes, if, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. That makes a lot of sense. And I think that that kind of freedom that you're now able to create allows you to, to potentially pursue the, the kind of art or creative uh, art that you want to go after because you have this freedom that you don't have to be at the whim of laying out brochures like you're saying. Mm -hmm. uh, absolutely. So you've, you actually uh, mentioned as well that you, you have um, a course, or you've created courses around teaching this to, to designers. Can you say a little more about that? Yeah. So um, early on, Creative Market had contacted me when I was just starting on that platform and said, can you write some articles about how you made this work? And, and, and I, I wrote some articles and people, there was a really good response. So I made a site called PassiveIncomeForDesigners.com. And um, basically what it is, is it's, it has a podcast with it. And it has like a free online course. And then there's like a premium course for people that are interested in that. And it basically just goes into like all of the details. I try to be extremely action based in the information I get from people and the information I share. And I just talk to creatives about how to do it. I don't expect that, you know, all creatives are going to go out and make, you know, $400,000 a year doing it. But for so many of them, just making a couple extra hundred dollars a month is the difference between taking on projects you love and taking on projects that um, like drain your energy. Mm -hmm. What do you think that, that creatives, based on what you've seen, what do you think that they can get started first? Like, What's the asset or skill that they should be focused on first to make that first step towards creating more passive income and more financial freedom for themselves? I think it's, I think it's becoming a an expert at paying attention to what people want, or maybe experts the wrong word, maybe just really consciously spending time regularly trying to think about what other people want and need as opposed to what you want to make. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. And are, are there places where you can look for that? I, I think that that's something that's important where you are, I th or the successful entrepreneurs I've seen, they they pay really close attention to the market. Their only source of kind of motivation or inspiration comes from their customers. And they, they make that a very important point because the last thing they want to do is start implementing their own uh, thoughts and and be so wrapped up in their own opinions. So, you know, obviously, you want to be a leader and, and have your own opinions, and, and but you also want to be able to validate that. So for anyone out there that wants to begin down this process of trying to pay more attention to what their market might want, where should they be looking? Yeah, so what 
whatever you're drawn to, drawn towards, um, no pun intended, or maybe mm-hmm. I guess pun intended, um, yeah. whatever you're drawn towards, um, go find where people are successfully selling things. I think there's a, there's an, a myth amongst some people that if you look and people are already selling something, that's a bad thing. And I'm sure, you know, Felix, if, if people are selling something, that's a good sign because it's making Mm -hmm. money. So go find things that you would be interested in selling yourself and go pay attention. Like, so at first, like if I was going to start again, I would go to creative market, or if I was wanting to sell something else, maybe Amazon or somewhere where people are buying those kind of products. And I would look at the products and I would look at what the best selling products were. And I would look at the comments and what people had to say about the products. And then I would buy the products and I would just start really thinking about what do they like about it and why do they like that about the product. Um, And then once you start to get a little traction, so like, for instance, once I started to build my email list, I would send out surveys. I still do. I send out a survey maybe once a quarter and it's just like three questions. And one of the questions is um, a question that I picked up from a guy named Jeff Walker. And it's just, what's the number one problem you're dealing with right now? And I get hundreds and hundreds of answers. And when I look at those, like a large majority is the same issue. And then I know like that's, that's a good starting point for what I'm going to make. Mm, Makes a lot of sense. So now you've, you obviously grown the business each and every single year, $400,000 in sales and revenue last year. What are some goals that you have for, for this, this year? Like what, what kind of milestones do you want to hit this year? I think my goal for, um, second half of the of 2017 and now for this year has been to make the business run more without me so when it started it was just me making products now i have um a variety of contractors and and freelancers that make most of uh, 80% of the business run um so i'm trying to get it to a point where i'm doing as little as possible because i want i want to pursue some other stuff so for instance i'm interested in the idea of yeah, you were mentioning you have a a new baby, and congratulations mm-hmm. on that again. Um, Thank so you. I have th- I have three kids. You have like, whoa, it would be so cool to make subscription boxes of art supplies for little kids because, mm-hmm. as a parent, I think most people can relate to the idea of feeling guilty when they need to do something and they have to put their child down and to watch a, a Disney movie for the fiftieth time or something <laughs> like that. And and I think everyone goes through that. And so I was like, wow, man, how cool would it be if every month you got an art box in the mail that because my kids love drawing stuff. And um, so for instance, I want to pursue that, but to do that, I have to completely pull myself away from the other business for the most part. So my goal to long story short, my goal is to remove myself as much as possible from retro supply for now, not because I don't love it, but because I just want to try some different stuff Mm -hmm. and then, um, and then focus a little more on this art box business. Makes a lot of sense. So thank you so much for your time, Dustin. So retrosupply.co is a website. And you also mentioned it was a passive income for designers.com is the, the, the course that you teach. Yes. And then, um, I also do a podcast with three other designers who have very unique perspectives and they're all entrepreneurs as well. And that's called the honest designer show. And you can just Google that. It'll pop up on the top. And if you're a designer or creative, you can hear four different perspectives from designer creative slash entrepreneurs very cool i think that's uh those are great steps for anyone out there that is a creative that wants to start making steps towards creating their own business so again thank you so much for your time dustin thank you so much felix it's fun to be on here's a sneak peek for what's in store in the next shopify masters episode if i put an ad out and it's i'm not getting any bites on it within like the first three to four days then uh, i can pretty much be sure that that's not going to work Thanks for listening to Shopify Masters, the e-commerce marketing podcast for ambitious entrepreneurs. To start your store today, visit shopify.com slash masters to claim your extended 30-day free trial. Also, for this episode's show notes, head over to shopify.com slash blog.